so today I'm going to show you one of my, I know they're all my favourites, one of my favourite contact cameras, which is the Contact 159NN. Now, I don't know why, what I do, but there's not many reviews of this camera. You don't see, I can't find any other YouTube videos about it, to tell you the truth. And I sort of understand why this happened. It doesn't seem to be hugely popular. The Contact uh, 159NN, was sort of a transitional camera. Basically, they had to find a replacement for the 139Q, uh, which was their small portable sort of camera. And the 159MN was that camera. But it was the first camera that was produced under the ownership of Kirasera, I can't pronounce it. Anyway, they'd taken over Yashica and their ceramics and a massive corporation. So. Some of their input is in this camera, I'd imagine, from the shape and the uh, materials used. Um, and also, it's a transitional point for the contact lenses. Um, program mode, things like that, were becoming you know, the, the big deal. Um, contact quite late in the game with program mode. This is 1985. So most other manufacturers had a program mode camera out, Olympus, all those kind of people. So they brought theirs in, but to do that, you needed to modify the lenses, apart from Olympus, who'd managed to work out a way to do that with their lenses without modifying their lenses. So, well, Contact needed to modify the lenses. So they produced a new line of lenses. You have the AE lenses and you have the MM lenses. And the MM lenses, I think I'll show you again in the 6-7 video, they have a green indication on the smallest aperture. So this one's a 50 and it has a, the 16, F, F16 is marked um, in the in green, which means it's an MM mode camera, and that means if you put it on here, it, it becomes you know you can do program modes, which is you know it decide the camera basically decides what you uh, a really nice place for you to shoot, a place for you to shoot without touching anything else. So you leave it on f sixteen, put it on the front, put it in program mode, and then you can just take photographs. Now, the, the reason I think that the 159mm really didn't make a splash, and it should do because it, it's a superb camera, is the fact that it's 1985. Now, what happened in 1985 was a huge shift in camera manufacturing technology. Minolta released their first autofocus. I believe Nikon released their first autofocus camera. Maybe that was 86, but it's very similar. And then Canon had an autofocus camera out as well. So... All the world is now shifting towards looking at autofocus cameras and the big manufacturers have got them out and contacts camera just doesn't have that so it appeared at that really weird point where the focus of the camera world was all on autofocus and and you know yeah, I think it got missed and it shouldn't have done because it it's a superb camera and I'm going to show you it here hopefully that focuses possibly not is it going to do it? It's my face again. Back there. There you go. It's in focus. Anyway, what is it? You know, it's as small as the 139Q. Um, but it has, it's not auto wind, rewind or anything, but it has some brilliant features. Obviously, there's the program mode. But because they were so far at the end of the program mode, I think they decided to add a little bit extra so it's got a high program mode and a low program mode and the low what, it, what VAST does it's not it, on the 167 it's fully developed you've got um, low speed and high speed and that sort of ramps up through the shutter speed aperture um, at a sort of angle so the shutter changes and the aperture changes but maintains a certain sort of um, relationship on this if you put it into low low program mode basically it keeps the shutter at 60 and then adjusts the aperture so that you get a shot. That's for like depth of field type stuff. Then there's a high speed mode where if you put it into high program, it locks the shutter at one one thousandths. And basically that's it. It sort of goes up as for high speed. Now, the other thing about this, which made was a quantum leap for it, you can shoot over the other, all the other cameras before. We're in the realms of the RTS 2s out. Um, this has... Um, a top shutter speed of one four thousandths. Now, it's really interesting. There was a, a couple of these that came out, uh, one four thousand shutter speed cameras, the FE, one of the other Nikons, and then 
some of them are made from titanium. It was like it's like a real salesy. Titanium is a great material, but you have to be really careful with it. It's sort of um, you know there are alloys of aluminium that are just as strong as as titanium, but titanium's like cool, isn't it? When we had all those titanium MacBooks, it's heavier than type an aluminium, but stronger. So it's like this counterbalance. So I, I believe there was one of the Nikon cameras that had problems with a titanium shutter. It kept uh, falling to pieces. So eventually they phased that out, went to an aluminium shutter, or an aluminium shutter. And I think that shutter was based on the Nikon, one of the Nikon high-speed cameras, the Nikon 800. That had, I believe that had a 1-8000 shutter, and that was aluminium. So aluminium's brilliant. You can do everything with it. It just doesn't, doesn't sound as sexy, does it? So this was the first one with a 1-4000 shutter speed, which you can reach which is fantastic. So it's also uh, very small and it's incredibly portable and it's very ergonomic. So yeah, that was, this was the 159mm. I honestly don't know why everybody's not raving about this camera. It's absolutely brilliant. I think, um, I think it just got missed off the gigantic radar of, of um, analog film cameras over the years because of the whole autofocus swirl. It just went to one side. And uh, some of the initial models that came out, because it's quite new technology at the time, I'd imagine, uh, they had a few problems with the electronics. Um, but the later models, obviously, as the production line goes through, they cure the problems, they, you know, they get the feedback and they sort of work it out. So the later serial numbers are probably better investment if you're going to get one. I mean, so I think what I'll do is I'll go through the body of the camera with you and then, you know, I'll, you know, then I'll, then I'll sort of um, finish off. Okay, so here we are. This is the top-down view of the Contact 159mm. As you can see, it's like standard lineup for a contact camera. Over here, we've got the the shutter controls, um, you know, shutter speed. Also, you've got your control command sort of command dial type thing to switch it into the different modes it's got. Because as we discussed, this is a program mode camera. So there's a small button on the back here. If you push it in it's in A, which is aperture priority. Now, obviously, if I've got a, a contact MM lens, which is the, you can see here by the 16, the green 16 on the lens, I can now flip it into program mode, which is the P, you see that properly. And that is just standard program. So that should sort of like, tries to give you the best exposure, stepping through the apertures and the shutter speeds for the lighting condition, uh, conditions that you, you can see. And then we've got, if you push it in again, LP, now this is the one that locks it at 160th and then gives you an appropriate aperture for that. And then if you press that in again, we've got HP, which is the one that locks it at 1 1,000th and then um, sort of tries to give you an appropriate aperture for that shutter speed. Sort of like a semi, it's not like a fully developed, these two modes aren't like a fully developed uh, program mode. Uh, anyway, I'll put it back to P. Yeah, so the winder here nicely locks in out the way. And then over here, obviously, a flash shoot. And then over here, we've got our on off switch here, like we saw on the RTS2. Very similar. If you look, some of the components look very familiar, like the um, AE lock on the RTS2 was exactly the same sort of shaped um, control here. So that's our A lock, basically. If you flip that forward, you A lock the camera, um, app, you know, um, lock the exposure. Um, on the top here, we've got our app, our um, exposure compensation, which is just again just turn, and then if you lift, this changes the ISO that you're shooting with the film. Now over here, we've got a small, tiny lever on this side here, there. And that's basically for multiple exposures. You pull that back, shoot, pull it back. Basically, you can do multiple exposures with the camera. So it's just a great little package and designed really well. Let's have a quick flip on the back here. Okay, and you can see there's the graph that shows you the program modes. LP straight up for the load, that's from the 60th, across and up for 1,000th. That's for the hype HP mode. And then 
you've got the program mode. See, it's like a proper program mode. It steps all the way up through the shutters and the apertures uh, at a sort of a slope. So that's the uh, that's the front, the back, and the top. Let's flip it over. You've got to be careful here because it tries to focus on the front of the camera. Okay, here's your. You've seen this before as well. If you look at the sort of R, um, one three eight Q, this is your um, self timer. You flip that up to there. Press the shutter. And I think you've got ten seconds. Flip that down. Depth of field preview is here. Move over. Now I always get these confused. Someone's going to pick me up on this. Either that's the X sync thing for the flash, or it's remote release, or that's the remote release on the back there. I've never used them. I do have a remote release for one of them, but either it's that way around. That's a flash thing, that's remote release. On the bottom, um, yeah, so basically, standard um, SR44 batteries, two of them go in here. And that's very much the camera. Now, what I'm saying about a tiny compact package here, this is such a great size. I'm going to put another camera in frame. And this is the smallest SLR, full frame SLR that was ever made. It's the Olymp uh, sorry, Pentax Super ME. So you just see them in size comparison. Now, someone's going to say, someone, someone in the comments is probably going to say, no, no, it was the MX. No, well, actually, they are, this is actually smaller on volume. If you look at the dimensions of the Super ME and the MX, um, one slightly longer than the other, but the volume of this camera is actually smaller. But you can see that Contact have really sort of made an effort here. The other thing, ergonomically, there's the hand grip. It's really weird. When you handle the 159mm, it feels like a modern digital camera. It, it's just really, you know, like what you're used to. So, yeah, so, you know, great camera. Obviously, yeah, there's the frame counters here. Um, but that's it. It's a small, powerful little, put that one out of shot, powerful camera. And, I, and as I said before, I don't know why people aren't raving about this thing. It, it's just such a cool camera. And um, it's really worth picking one of these up. Um, it's got a great shutter sound when it fires as well. Anyway, so that's it. That's the um, Contact 159. Amen. Okay, so here we are looking through the viewfinder of the Contact 159MM. Right hand side, you can see there's the shutter speed indicator. If I touch the shutter button, there it comes up. It gives you the current aperture and it is in program mode. If I change program modes, It doesn't give you any indication of what mode you're in, but you can see that there when it's flashing it. Hang on. It's flashing at 60 because I'm in low mode. That's it. Beautiful, clean uh, viewfinder. It was You had to get a technician to replace the focus screens on these. Um, it, it, unlike some of the earlier contacts where you could do it manually yourself. Anyway, that's the viewfinder. So there you have it. That's the 159 contact 159 MN. Um, it's a tremendous camera. It really, really is. And you can see it there from the size comparison to the Olympus cameras um, that it's really small and compact, a bit more chunky, but it's really ergonomic. It's really nice to hold. Um, it's got everything. It's like one of my favorite ones. It is a battle with my contact cameras because I just never know which one to pick up. I love them all. But I mean, this is just a beautiful thing. It's so, it, I know I mentioned I don't like light cameras, but when you put the lens on this, it's just like the perfect weight. And it's so, um, it's so uh, neat and compact. And program mode is a funny thing. I mean, I like program mode because sometimes I just don't want to have stress and you want to try and get a, a photograph. The program mode works great. I wouldn't use the, um, high program and low program i don't know if that's really got a use for me um but i've never really tried it but no it's um it's a truly great camera and they are a bit pricey online i'll tell you the story about this one's quite funny basically i had another five nine that wasn't working the electronics worked um but the camera but they weren't working properly so i sent it off to get it to see if i could get it repaired and it came back and it was beyond economical repair 
So and I even offered the guy to keep the camera for spares. I'm really nice that way. But he said, I've got some of these as parts. I don't need it. So I, I got it back. And then literally as I'm not, you know, I'm looking on eBay again, looking to see if I can find another one. There was one on there and it's the classic eBay classic, beautiful camera, not tested, don't have the batteries, but it did look good. I mean, it had a high serial number on the camera. So I thought I'll chance it. And I think it was 80 quid. So it turns up and lo and behold, when I put batteries in it, it didn't work. So I thought, okay, okay, another Duff camera. But uh, just because I thought I put the batteries in upside down, I took the battery holder out of this one, put it in, took the battery holder out of the one I know that works, took their batteries out, put it in this, and it lit up. And it's perfect. Because what I think's happened is the battery holder on this one has a care line crack, so it doesn't pass the current. Because obviously in the broken one, well, the one with the broken electronics, it doesn't work in that either. So if that chap hadn't have sent that camera back to me and said, I can't keep it, I would have never have known that this camera is actually fully functional and in perfect condition. So there you go. Bit of a risk there and it was a total gamble, but it's paid off because I mean, this is just a great camera. And I wish people would sort of get them and you'll understand when you get one of these, why they're so nice. Anyway, uh, thanks for watching.